Good afternoon, everyone. At this time, I'll call this meeting of the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society to order. My name is Richard Conkle, and I'm the society president. Um, to begin with, we'll have a little bit of business we'll deal with since we haven't for several months, and then we'll get right into our program. So, um, we have any first time guests here today? You've been here before. Okay. So, we, we have uh, a number of people here, which is nice to see, and we hope we have some people here online as well. Um, at this time, we'll have the secretary uh, give the secretary's report. Which microphone do you want me to use? Whichever. <laughs> I think they'll hear you. you just stand, just stand right close by. Well, I'll just stand behind you. That's fine. There you go. Okay. Uh, March general for the April general meeting took place the 4th of April, 2021 at the York History Center. 10 people attended in person and the program was live streamed. The prior meeting minutes were read and accepted. The treasurer has re reported a balance of $19,218.98 at the end of March. Membership reported 196 members. Uh, 19 of those memberships were family. Nicole Smith provided an overview of the upcoming York History Center programs, noting that all programs are recorded and available online. Um, the York History Center is open by reservation as of April 1st. Vice President Jonathan Steyer provided information on our upcoming programs. And the program at the April meeting was Mother Cumberland, researching with Cumberland County Records, presented by Kara Curtis. Thank you. Uh, this time our treasurer, Margaret Bird, will give the treasurer's report. <clears throat> um, the uh, balance at April 1st, 2021 was $19,218.98. Receipts for April were membership renewals of $670, a new, a new member $25, and donations of $36 for total receipts of $731. Disbursements in April were a speaker fee to Cumberland Historical Society, $119.80. Postal connections for the uh, printing and uh, the printing of publication 85, $1,323.41. Staples for envelopes for mailing that publication, $52.23. Uh, the uh, post office publication mailing, $470.46, and also post office for miscellaneous public publication mailing. This was order, an order for publication, $5.60. Total disbursements, $1,971.50, leaving the balance at April 30th, $17,978.48. For May, that was the opening balance. Receipts and membership renewals, $385, another new member of $25, and donations of $52. Disbursements, speaker fee, the Muddy Creek Forks Tour, $360, and postal connections for the April, May, June no newsletter, $211.39. Total of disbursements, $571.39. The uh, balance at May 31st, 2021 is $17,869.09. Thank you, Margaret. That will be filed for audit. Do we have a membership report? Yes, membership for May is 193. We have renewals 78 and uh, two new uh, members for the next 2021-22. Uh, we had two members that had passed away Arlene Miller, uh, the wife of Jacob Miller, they had been member, members for many, many years, and um, a very sudden death, uh, Barry Sowers, who was Melinda Sowers' husband, uh, and he, uh, she was our treasurer for a number of years. And uh, the, I, I talked to her on the phone, and uh, it's, she's having a very hard time because it was a sudden death. And we saw him at Muddy Creek Forks the week before, so that was kind of sad. That's it. Thank you. Um, Nicole, do we have any news from the History Center? Hi, everyone. Good to see you all and online. Um, just a couple of announcements. First, that um, all the History Center programs are being live streamed on Facebook and recorded and available on the York County History Center YouTube page. 
If you have any questions about our programs or to make reservations, just visit our website, yorkhistorycenter.org. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, this Wednesday, June 16th, is the York Civil War Roundtable. That program will be in person and uh, streamed online. Speaker is Cody Ash and speaking about veterans, the Veterans Reunion of 1889. Uh, this coming Saturday, we're opening an exhibit in this room by Ophelia Chambliss called Celebrating Juneteenth. Uh, um, and there's also a rare printing of the Emancipation Proclamation signed by Lincoln. That's actually currently on exhibit in the lobby, so please check that out before you leave. And then next week, June 23rd, is our All Vets program, oral history program, which is in person and streaming. And the speaker is Al Ferguson. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Jonathan, do you wish to say anything about upcoming programs? This is our last program for this year. Um, now that we our new year starts in September, and actually our programs will start at the end of August. So uh, Jonathan can fill us in on what's going on. Yes, I just want to emphasize that we will have no program in July. The next program will be held August 29th, which is the last Sunday in August. If you got the York County History Center's newsletter, I think it says the first Sunday in August. That's not correct. The meeting will be the last Sunday in August. Our speaker that day will be Aaron McWilliams from the State Archives talking about how to navigate the online resources of the State Archives. Mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of a follow up to the State Archivist presentation earlier this spring. He talked about what the archives is doing. Aaron's going to show us how to actually use what uh, they have online and um, how we can take advantage of that. I'm just going to go over the programs for the fall. I do have the whole calendar filled out till June of next year, but I'll just mention the upcoming pro programs. In October, October the 3rd, our own Nicole Smith will be speaking about the genealogical resources of the History Center's library. This was a request following the fine presentation from Cumberland County, somebody said we ought to do York County as well. So Nicole's gonna talk about that. And on November the 7th, uh, Scott Mingus, who many of you know as the uh, uh, proprietor of the Cannonball Law blog online, will be speaking about the churches and chaplains in York County during the Civil War. And so those, those will be the programs for this year. And later on, I'll go over the programs for uh, 2022. And eventually all this will be on our website and in the newsletter as well. Oh, I need to introduce the program for the way. Yes. <laughs> Normally in June of our program year, we, at least every other year, we try to have a Henry James Young Award where we uh, give uh, recognition to somebody who's contributed significantly to particularly York County genealogy or local history. Because of the pandemic, we did not get any nominations and we didn't work sure if we did nominate people if they would feel comfortable coming. So what we decided to do this year uh, today is to talk about the award. What is the award? Who was Henry James Young and so forth? Hopefully stimulating some people to submit nominations for people who would be worthy to receive that award. Our speakers today are our president, Richard Kunkel, who many of you know, and uh, our treasurer and membership secretary, Margaret Berg, who just, you just saw speak, and they're going to talk about this award and some of the recipients. So we'll take it away. Thank you, John. So the Henry James Young Award came about partly, I would say, because the Historical Society of York County had awarded Henry Young a Louis, Louis Miller Award or Louis Miller Award. And uh, the board got to thinking about that and thought that he was an ideal person. He was living at the time to name an award for excellence in genealogy and local history. So almost 30 years ago, it's about what 28 years ago now, this came about. Um, and so I'm going to read a little bit about Henry Young, tell you who he was, and then we were going to go briefly through all the uh, award recipients that have occurred here over the past almost 30 years. So Henry James Young was uh, born here in York, actually not too far from here, um, in, on February the 16th, 1908. He was the eldest of four children of James A. Young and his wife, Mary E. Hess. 
Um, his father's family uh, had lived in the city of York or the borough of York for quite some time. And um, some of the earlier ancestors were from out in the county. Uh, and his mother's family was from Lancaster County. She was from Bainbridge. Um, in 1912, the family moved to New Jersey. Uh, the father had gotten a job as a manager of a store. And unfortunately, the mother um, became incapacitated and was hospitalized in a state psychiatric hospital in New Jersey where she lived for the rest of her life. Um, the young family had to return to York. The younger two children were sent to live with, with um, relatives and the elder two were sent to live with strangers. Um, during much of his youth, he was fortunate in being reared by a rather wealthy family in York, uh, Charles and Marie Polak. Uh, the Polak family were longtime watchmakers and jewelers. Uh, they had a jewelry store and watch store uh, right across from the courthouse. There's now, um, there's a little plaza there that this building was torn down and there's a parking lot behind that now. That's where the jewelry store is. And actually the home where he was spent much of his youth is really it's within walking distance of where I live now. It's called McClellan Heights. And it's, it runs parallel to Country Club Road. It's the first, there's various roads that are called terraces and it's called Villa Terrace. It's the first one off of Grantley as you're going up that hill. And the two Polak brothers who were involved in the jewelry store, they had houses that were right side by side. He was uh, at the Hoffman Orphanage in Adams County from 1922 to 1926, but then returned to the Polak family where he spent two years preparing for college at William Penn High School. And he graduated from there and went on to go to Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster where he uh, graduated with a degree in history. His intent was to become a teacher, but when he graduated uh, in 1932, things were not so good with the Great Depression and he could not secure a teaching job. So um, I guess you could kind of call it the gig economy. Word got out that he was available to maybe do some things. And the Historical Society of York County was in need of uh, someone to do some things for them. So um, his first opportunity came that uh, they wished to have the early church registers of Christ Lutheran Church translated and he undertook that job and did a very good job with that. He had taught himself to read German script while at the Hoffman Orphanage. Um, there was a book there and he learned how to write it. It was an old German grammar book and um, it's kind of an unusual way of learning that but he always had an interest in languages um, and could speak or had some proficiency in many languages. Um, that translation job resulted in a full-time position. When we started at the Historical Society of York County, they were on the third floor of the courthouse, and he saw their move to the Bill Meyer House, which is now part of First Presbyterian Church, where they were before they came to this building. So he really did a lot in his time uh, there. He, he was director of the Historical Society from 1933 to 1942, and then in, intermittently during the years 1951 to 57. And he was a true researcher, um, translated many, many more church records, did a very early microfilm project with them gathering those church records, uh, instituted the vital statistic card files and started doing family reports, um, just really did so much that makes the library so wonderful for, for researchers. Um, he also compiled the records on York County and the American Revolution and assisted with the York and Adams County cemetery surveys, those cemetery books that were done at that time. Um, after re he went into, he served in World War II and then on the GI Bill went on to uh, get further studies and got a doctorate in history through Johns Hopkins University. And during his time there, he was uh, roommates with Dr. Charles Gladfelder, who many of you, of course, know, and we'll talk about him later as well. And uh, they were working on their respective dissertations. Um, Dr. Young's dissertation was on the Loyalists in Pennsylvania. And uh, 
Charles Gladfelder's, of course, was what became Pastors and People, a uh, study of the Lutheran and, and German Reformed churches in Pennsylvania. Um, he worked at the Pennsylvania State Archives as an archivist uh, after sort of while getting his doctorate in the latter parts of that. And then once he had gotten his doctorate, he uh, got a position teaching as a history professor at Dickinson College in Carlisle and pretty much lived the rest of his life uh, in Carlisle. He did have a sabbatical year where um, he was uh, uh, in Oxford, England, at the university there. I'm sure that was an interesting experience for him. Um, personally, with me, I had started doing genealogy when I was in high school, and I saw his name all over things, but you know, it was the 1930s, and this was the late 80s. And I thought, well, that's ancient history. It's 50 years ago. And then I ended up at Dickinson College and people said, well, you should look him up. And I was like, how old is this man? He has to be pretty old. And um, went and visited him. He was living in a, um, like an assisted living sort of home that was right off the campus. And um, a lot of times Friday night after dinner, I would visit there until my friends were ready to go do something exciting. And uh, we had nice visits and I really got to, I learned a lot from him. He was very, uh, very interested in the things. He was a lifelong reader and learner, and um, he was very interested in DNA in the early days of that. It's too bad he had he didn't live long enough to see all the potential in some of these things. But um, he got very interested in in genealogy again. He was always interested in genealogy. He published things on his own families, and he did extensive work on his foster family. Um, the mother was from New England, a lot of her families, and traced back to um, English royalty and such a, a medieval genealogy. And he had a vast collection of that stuff. Most of it's at the um, Dickinson College Library now. But um, he started doing uh, Catholic church records, parting those. They had not been in the biostatistic cards. He actually gave up his bed. He didn't sleep in the bed beforehand. He slept in a, one of those reclining chairs. So he, he wanted room for a card table so he could work on these cards. And I, there's a lot of handwritten cards on the, by Henry Young for the Catholic church records. He, Al Rose would bring him copies and he went through them. Most of them he found very interesting. Uh, Bach, or Buchanan Valley, he said, this is a boring church record. It's all the same families. No one, no, no one ever came in or left that, that valley, he said. Uh, but most of them he really found interesting and he would tell me things about that. And a lot of people from York came to visit him at that time as well. Al Rose, Corey Offenbach, David Hively, June Lloyd and Betty Brown, all of whom were later Henry Young Award winners. So um, it was really nice to uh, have those connections with people back in York. And it was, it was always interesting to visit with him. And, and a lot of times we would take him out to a restaurant or something like that. Chinese, yes, he liked Chinese. And would always say, don't put milk in Chinese tea. That's a mistake he did in Oxford, I think, or something like that. Never again. So um, his last year or so was sort of declined rather suddenly. Uh, he had hydroencephalitis and some other ailments. And he, he passed away February 11, 1995 in Carlisle. And his request was to be buried um, in Prospect Hill Cemetery that his remains be placed there on a plot. And it's, it's one of the highest points in the cemetery of his great grandparents, William and Margaret Strine Wolf. And they, were, they really didn't have a stone there. Um, the great grandfather was some sort of ironmonger or whatever. And originally there was a decorative uh, wrought iron fence that was around the lot, which of course is long gone. But there is a, a military marker for Henry Young. So it was entirely uh, appropriate to name this award for him because he, he did so much. I mean, he was, you know, we can all strive to be a little bit like Henry Young, to be as interested in, in everything and exploring everything and, you know, really trying to search things out and find out what things are all about. And he was pretty much right to the end. That was his, his, his whole being. It's a real tribute to him. So I, I think he was very tickled about having that award named after him. And um, it's really good that we remember him. So the first awards were given in 1993. 
And he actually was the person who nominated a lot of the people. Um, and one of the people that the first name that he said that should be honored was Alice Starner because she was really a helpmate to him um, in those early years at the Historical Society. She did a lot, so much work with the cemetery survey, um, putting together so many of the records. Um, she was just really a good researcher. I guess she, their personalities that worked well together and she was really able to help do so much of the work that needed to be done. And she actually lived in my parents' neighborhood. I never really knew her. She was pretty infirm by the time we gave her the award. She, um, she was born uh, 26th of August, 1927, and she died the 18th of July, 1995. Um, her son lived sort of one side of where my parents lived and she lived another. You would often see him walking to go see his mother. So uh, it was about a block away, I would say. And um, my father sometimes would talk to, uh, to her son, but um, I, unfortunately, I did not know Alice Sterner, but Henry had nothing but good things to say about Alice Sterner and all the good work that she did. So she was actually the first person to be uh, awarded with that. And then uh, the second person the same year was Landon Charles Reisinger. He was born October 1914 and died in January of 2005. He was the son of Landon Reisinger and Lydia Ann Smith and his wife, was Barbara C. Book. Uh, Landon was interested in genealogy when he was a teenager. He became the librarian and the archivist for the Historical Society during the 70s and was instrumental in establishing the family surname files, which are so valuable to the family researchers that uh, uh, come in. During his years as librarian, he expanded the library significantly by acquiring books that he felt uh, were going to be important for a research library. The library volunteer program also expanded during his tenure, and um, he was instrumental in the building of the York Colonial Courthouse, which as a, a friend, a, a good friend of Judge Rawhauser, uh, he had researched and they achieved that, uh, getting that building built. Um, that little bit of it, this bit of information was courtesy of Jonathan. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan. You're next. Also, that, that first year that it was awarded in 1993, we had a lot, but there weren't, uh, other than like Landon was there, but the other ones could not be. Um, the Cannon family, this was Henry Young as well. He really wanted to see that they were honored and acknowledged. It, it, what we have there is a husband and wife and their daughter. Um, Ralph Smizer Cannon, who was born in 1874 in Harrisburg and, and died in 1948 here in York County. His wife, Edith Beard Cannon, who was born in 1880 and died in 1949. And their daughter, Alice Blanche Cannon, who later... Uh, she was born in 1915. She died in 1998. At the time we awarded this, she was in a nursing home. I did speak with her that time, but she was too infirm to attend. Um, Ralph Cannon was a banker in New York. On his mother's side, he descended in that picture, which unfortunately is from a newspaper, but that's Ralph Cannon. Um, he was a banker, and for about 27 years, he was the treasurer of the Historical Society and was very supportive of the programs and, and expansion of uh, their collections and all that sort of thing. So um, he worked at it from that end. His wife, Edith Beard Cannon, is what Henry Young had told me. They sort of carried things through during the World War II years when Henry Young was away. They sort of ran the library. Edith um, actually even uh, transcribed some church records and things like that. You'll see her name on various things in the library and their daughter, Alice, um, she helped as well. So um, Henry Young thought it was really important to honor um, the Cannon family uh, with this award. Okay, in 1995 then, uh, Skyler Brossman, born in 1927 and uh, died in May of 1998. 
Uh, he was the son of Charles Grossman and Sarah Deck, and his wife was Gladys Miller. Lived in Berks County all his life. He uh, served in the Merchant Marines during World War II and in the Army during the Korean War. Uh, around 1950s, late 1950s, he became interested in genealogy. He had researched the, his the ancestral names, Grossman, Deck, Dassert, Mosier families. Uh, in the uh, 1960s, he copied all the tombstone inscriptions in the uh, in uh, Tupelhocken, Tupelhocken Township, Berks County. He wrote a lot of church and fire company, uh, local community histories, uh, was, uh, quite a bit of that. The main thing that I think he became an honoree for us was that he um, had a, a lady write to him and say, why don't you write a column about the families and um, have a newspaper, have it published in a newspaper. So he went around and asked about it and they said, yeah, they'd give it a try. So he started our Keystone Families and he began writing the column in October of 1996. And at the time the award was presented to him, he had been writing for 29 years, the same column. And after his death, it was taken over by, uh, um, it, it appeared in the Middletown newspaper, Press and Journal. We subscribed to it for a number of years and we saved the columns. And there's a number of them that are uh, saved here and have been indexed in that. But he always covered uh, things about Keystone, Pennsylvania families and their, and their uh, genealogy. Um, he uh, was, oh, he was in charge of a veterans uh, history project and he collected several thousand records of the veterans uh, from the veterans in the uh, Western area of Berks County. The one thing that um, I, I believe David, uh, David Hively uh, presented this. And the one thing he told David that he wanted to be sure he said was that um, to avoid the loss of research, donate your research results to a historical or genealogical library. This was an obvious one in 1997. Dr. Charles H. Gladfeller he had a personal connection to Henry Young and probably for York County history, certainly in the top two or three historians of the 20th century, I would say. Um, Dr. Gladfelder was from the Glenrock area. Um, he was born in 1924 and unfortunately passed away in 2013. He was the son of an E. Pauline Gladfelder Kraut. And uh, when Henry Young was uh, director at the Historical Society of the Billmeyer House, uh, the young Dr. Gladfelder was coming in there to do research. He sort of was interested in genealogy and local history at an early age. He went to Gettysburg College and then went to Johns Hopkins University in the way their ages sort of lined up and ended up being roommates at Johns Hopkins. Um, Dr. Gladfelder got his doctorate and went on to teach history at Gettysburg College for many years, served there as a dean as well, and um, wrote extensively on Pennsylvania German history, local York County history, Adams County history. I mean, he, he was just a, a true researcher. What always made one thing that always amazed me about Dr. Gladfelder, I mean, I would write to him sometimes and I always got a beautiful response. He would go back through his research notes, answer my question, and then some. But man never owned an electric typewriter or computer. It was always, yeah, I think he had the same manual typewriter from probably when he did his. his doctoral thesis, or maybe when he went to college, they bought it for him or high school. Um, but he was pretty good on that manual typewriter, and he produced a lot of good work with that. Um, but, you know, if, if you had a question about York County history, um, he, would, he would probably answer it or could find something to find about it. I have a confession to make here. He corrected me on something, and there's a family association that has a tombstone in the wrong cemetery, the Ryan family association. Um, there's some deaths that are in Christ Lutheran and Strayers that say, um, Henrik Wolf's place is the burial place. 
And there's a cemetery that's called Bots and Wolves and all sorts of things. It's out in the middle of where some in West Manchester Township in the middle of um, stone quarries around. And that family put up a beautiful monument in, in that cemetery. And those people were not buried there. They're buried in, it's uh, called Laux Cemetery now, but that's actually where uh, Henry Wolf and his spouse are buried. It's, it's very accessible. This other cemetery is not very accessible. Uh, Laux Cemetery is right across from one of the main entrances to what was the West Manchester Mall. And I just haven't, this is a public confession right now. I haven't had, I haven't had the heart to tell them that they put this $10,000 monument in the wrong cemetery and they really should move it. So um, most of them are in North Carolina. Let's see if anyone really watches this and it gets <laughs> the news trippers down. But Dr. Gladfelder says, that's not the right place. He said, it's, it's, it's that one. He was absolutely right. So, um, you know, you learn something along the way. The one thing I remember Dr. Gladfelder for is that he said that if the uh, cemetery is next to the church, it is a graveyard. If it's not next to the church and stands alone, it's a cemetery. I tell that to my grandchildren when we're driving around and that grandma. He, well, he, he did so much work. Well, they did the, um, he, Pastor Weiser did um, a special publication that we published for them um, on the uh, petition for York County and did the bios on all the signers of the petition. Um, he also did, uh, we had a program that was down at St. Jacob Stone Church, which is uh, where a lot of his ancestors, but a lot of his wife's ancestors are from. He did a lot of work on that. Um, just you name it. He did a history of Jefferson way back, uh, Jefferson, York County, Pennsylvania, Wartner family, early work on the, the, his own family, the Gladfeller family. Um, some of the books that they sell through the Historical and Museum Commission, the one of the Pennsylvania Germans is written by Dr. Charles Gladfelder. I mean, he, he was just right up there. He was, and it was really appropriate to give him that award. That same year, that's him actually receiving the award. I'm holding it, but I got cut off. We wanted Dr. Charles, not me. That same year, um, Sam, Samuel or Sam Saylor was also awarded uh, the Henry James Young Award. And um, he was born in 1920 and died in 2007. He was born in Chancellor Township, uh, York County, Pennsylvania, the son of John Andrew Saylor and Emma E. Hawk. Um, and he actually was born on a farm that was later owned by my great grandmother's younger brother, youngest brother, who just died the other year at the age of 105 there. So, um, Sam uh, came to genealogy, maybe a little on the later side, after he raised a family and so forth, but really got into it. He did a history of um, the Sailor family, and he was a, a dedicated volunteer back in the library for many years. He compiled a lot of information. He went to Hartford, Baltimore, uh, Carroll County, Maryland. I don't know if he went to Cecil County or not, but he he found all those people that uh, escaped over the border to elope or whatever in Maryland. You know, the, the years ago, you didn't have to get a blood test. You could marry your first cousin and all kinds of things if you went to Maryland. So our people wanted to kind of stay out of the, uh, have their secret marriage, so to speak. They, they, they did that. Um, and he, he found all those and uh, published those. Um, he just did a lot of work. And um, his last years, he, he fought cancer for a long time, but he was he was here very regularly, and he, he volunteered and did a tremendous amount of work uh, on genealogy and local history. Here we're at 1999. Uh, John Heisey. Uh, he was born in 1925, and he died in 1998. The son of Joseph Heisey and Esther Baker. His wife was Mary Davis. John was librarian and director of research at the Historical Society and from, uh, from 1967 to July 1973. He did research for the museum, worked on the library files, and replied to many letters from family his historians. After leaving the Historical S Society, he became a professional genealogist and a speaker on genealogical and historical topics. 
From 1974 to 1984, he taught political science courses and continuing education classes on genealogy and related topics at, at York College of Pennsylvania. He also taught genealogy classes and seminars at numerous locations in several states. Beginning in 1980, he wrote genealogy columns for several publications. South Central is indebted to John for its existence. In 1975, during one of his classes at York College, he suggested the formation of a genealogical society. And um, he had, uh, the people had asked, well, how can we keep on learning after we've been in this class and that? And he suggested, they took his advice seriously and South Central was born. Uh, he um, uh, was uh, in the army, served in the army in Europe during World War II. He was wounded and he had been a right-handed person. He had to learn to be a left-handed person for the rest of his life then because he had been wounded. Um, but I, I have, I had a class with him and that's what really kind of got me started too. I think got a lot of people started from after reading the things that I, I've uh, seen and, and getting preparing for this, but, um, he was, he was a very good teacher. He really got you interested in genealogy. And I also, okay, Arthur Weiner. Uh, Arthur born in 18, in 1926, sorry, Arthur and died December 2011. He was the son of Edgar William Weiner and Margaret Jane Plants. His occupation during his lifetime was an active partner in the Weiner family dairy farm in Stravan, Stravan Township, Adams County. He had become an authority on tracing attractive land in his native Adams County. Uh, he um, would trace the, back to the first claimants and subsequent owner he had a lot of that information. Uh, he joined Adams County Historical Society in 1943, and uh, it was just a few years after his high school graduation. He helped uh, with a lot of the projects with that society. In 1976, he was named assistant director of the society. He acquired a set of 150 aerial maps of Adams County. Uh, from the uh, Department of Agriculture, and he uh, took those maps, and with the early surveys of the property, he located the property on the aerial map and uh, was able to find the location without GPS. He was a real, he was the GPS, um, and uh, he uh, had all of this for the Adams County Society. It can be found there. He, has all of that together, what he put together for that. In 1992, after seven years of research, he was um, uh, able to publish, or, or the uh, Historical Society was able to publish the first work on the manner of mask, which was 43,500 acres of land surrounding Gettysburg. He also contributed maps and additional details to a work done on Dick's Choice, which is what he spoke to us about at one of our meetings. Um, that is a, a large area of land in York and Adams County. Okay. And, and I think if I remember correctly, poor Arthur is wearing a, a neck brace there. I believe he had had an accident on the farm where he fell down through the hay mow into and the- his neck. Yeah, and mm -hmm. but luckily, able to come get his award so yeah, he, he, he was a definite uh, <laughs> an old bachelor farmer if you, if you met it in 2001 we honored Annette Kunzelman Berger and unfortunately she has recently passed away at the age of 90 she died in February we had sent her greetings on her 90th birthday uh, we had sent a past card around here which was back in November um, Annette uh, was originally from the Benengo County area, had lived in Ohio, and then um, through all her interest in genealogy and, and tracing uh, the immigrant origins of Pennsylvania German settlers, she and her husband had relocated to Myerstown where they lived for years and eventually retired to Elizabethtown, the Masonic home. Um, Annette had an unbelievable memories, but she had to because, you know, I do a lot of genealogy and look at a lot of church records and things, and somehow she 
compiled all these books, and I'm sure she has helped many of us here who have Pennsylvania German ancestry find where our ancestors came from in Germany. Um, some of her earliest works, um, the large ones, were on the Western Palatinate and um, what they called the Northern Kreifgau and the Northern part of Alsace. Those were all Pennsylvania German Society publications, uh, large volumes with lots and lots of information on uh, Pennsylvania German immigrants. And then she did many monographs on single towns uh, and then some compilations later in her career um, from updating some of her other things. I think I have everything that she's ever written. And I, you know, I sometimes just sit down and go through some of those things because I find things. And um, she's just helped so many people and her work will continue to help people for years to come. I found out that her collections are now in the Pennsylvania German Heritage Center at Kutztown University. So they're preserved for researchers to look at from there. And I'm sure she had many things that never got published that you could find uh, some interesting information from her, her work, but didn't happen. Um, because I mean, life is only so long. And she did she did a tremendous amount of work in, in the years that she she did it. So um, it's pretty amazing. Also in two thousand one, we honored Albert Rose, and um, I was really honored to do, do the presentation at the time we honored him. So I went and interviewed him and talked to him a lot, and I came out so uh, respectful and, and amazed by Al Rose. He was an amazing man. There's a little saying that um, people come and go in our lives, and some leave footprints on our heart, and he did on mine. <laughs> but anyway, Al was born in 1923, and he died in February of 2020. He was the son of Harry Rose and Rose Anna Staley. Uh, his wife was Mary Madeline Routson. Routson. Uh, he made very sure that I was going to mention her when I did the presentation because she was a very big help to him and worked a lot with him. So he, so I did. He came to genealogy late. He didn't start until after he retired from precision components. And um, he, uh, uh, Gloria Achenbaugh and Betty Brown became his mentors with his research and they got him to join South Central in 1986. Betty Brown said he was the man who never said no, evidenced by the many major tasks he took on. He made copies of the more than 15,000 original land records of York and Adams County, organized the copies and put them in notebooks. He made copies from microfilm of the original 1798 federal uh, glass tax schedules for York and Adams County. And those were something that we used uh, for the uh, publications that we did. Uh, he made paper copies of all the Catholic church records on microfilm at the York History Center, paper copies of the York County Boyer and Terminer York uh, Court papers. He also was among the South Central members who were organizing estate papers at the courthouse years ago. He photographed some, all the cemeteries in Adams County, put the photos in an album with the descriptions of the cemeteries with a map and directions on how to find them. He designed and made the wooden boxes that we use now to put the cards in when we bring them out for the families to look at the cards. Uh, Sorry, lost my place here. <laughs> um, he was a volunteer in the library who assisted patrons for many years and his last project was organizing the postcard collection. Yeah, I saw that I saw him working on um, just before uh, he uh, didn't spend as much time here. And um, he served two terms as president of South Central. He was also the secretary and he was also a director of, and was in charge of special projects. Al was a World War II veteran who was among the third wave of soldiers on D-Day into France, going into France. He uh, worked to, uh, in the organizations he belonged to, uh, he worked for the establishment of the World War II Memorial in Washington and uh, tried uh, 
which they eventually got, recognition in France for the Americans who served there on D-Day. He uh, planned several uh, of the army reunions and he attended them. And the last being in France when in uh, 2019, when he was 96 years old. Great, great guy. Yes. I just wanted to add, he also documented the Oh, thank you. Good. Yeah, he, he did a lot of that. He liked that. Okay, this is a, it's such a good picture that I didn't just do David Hively in the picture I included because all those people were uh, winners of this award. And that was the year that David Hively and Neil Hively were given the award. So the, the one on the far left is the Reverend Dr. Neil Hively, and we have a net burger. Uh, there's Al Rose in the middle, and David Hively that year it was Pentecost, it was the day that the award was, so he wore his red shirt to church and ended up wearing it here to the award ceremony. I think it's the only time I ever saw David Hively in a red shirt. So, And then we have Dr. Charles Gladfelder there on the end. Um, David Hively uh, was a uh, I believe an original member of the genealogy class, or maybe next year, he was an early member of the genealogy society and was on the board early on and became really uh, very interested in genealogy. Um, he grew up on a farm in Chansford Township and I think went to the same, the Borough One Room School with June Lloyd, although uh, well, you're pretty close in age, a couple years apart, yeah. so. You were probably in that school with him for a while. Um, a lot of his aunts were teachers. I don't know if you had them as teachers or not. Yeah. So, um, and then actually the History Center had an exhibit, an online exhibit from the aunts' uh, journeys across the country. Was, Beatrice was one and Harriet. Those were the, the two that my, my grandmother had them as teachers as well. And David became a teacher. He graduated from Redline High School, then he went to Lebanon Valley College and was a very good math teacher in the Redline School District for, for many years. Um, he became a very dedicated genealogist. And um, it was at a family reunion when I was probably in ninth grade, something like that, that a distant relative had a letter that he wrote about the Shaw family. That's my grandmother's maiden name and had a lot of information I didn't know. So I wrote to him and he had my cousin in school. He said, is this kid serious about this stuff? And my cousin said, yeah, yeah pretty serious. So he was a great teacher to me. He, he was really very kind and his teaching background came out. He, you know, he did things the right way, you know, as far as going to original sources and research. And, and he's done a tremendous amount of research over the years. For many years, he did uh, what was called the Hively Family Newsletter, where he did in-depth research on his paternal family. Um, the spelling's a little different. He's had the same license plate for years. The original spelling from the Schwabisch Alb region of Württemberg is an H-A-I-B-L-E, and two brothers came over in 1749 uh, and settled here in York County. Now, the thing about the Hively family there's not a lot that stayed here in York County, some, but they seem to have spread everywhere the Pennsylvania Germans went down the Valley of Virginia and Ohio and just everywhere. So, and even Arkansas and down into the South and so forth. So with his family newsletter that he did, it was really, it was basically it's thousands of pages, I think, but he published um, and did extensive research on these people. And this was in the days before Ancestry.com, I mean, he had someone in Washington, D.C. looking up census records because you couldn't just press a button and it came up. Um, you know, you had to go and look at microfilm and all that sort of fun thing. So um, he also did a lot for this organization. He was the um, editor of the newsletter for, for many years and produced a lot of good material in that. And he did a lot with special publications, especially the glass tax for Cindy Hartman. He did a lot of the proofreading um, and, and really helped with, with that. So um, David's been a very good researcher and a, a good genealogist over the years. Now he and Reverend Dr. Neil Otto Hively 
They are related, but it's not very close. Um, Reverend Hively, he uh, is from the Williamsport area and became a Lutheran minister and ended up down uh, at Steltz's church, which was a union church at the time. He was the Lutheran pastor there. And he had an interest in the local history there. And Dr. Charles Gladfelder got him into doing maps. Um, that's where he started in, in the southern part of Cadoris Township. And eventually he uh, mapped pretty much all of York and Adams County. Um, and using the records of the state archives, the deputy surveyor's records here, um, he lived it for many years. He had a, a large Lutheran parish in Chambersburg until his retirement. Now he lives in Florida and it's very kind that he's given all his uh, rights to, um, to his works to the History Center. And um, so they profit from all his research over the years. He was always very kind in sharing his research ahead of time. I, helped uh, with doing a chance for township history over 20 years ago now. And uh, he was doing a, the, the maps on that and he sort of advanced that to me, a copy of that. And that was really helpful uh, in, in writing that work, um, but always very interested and, and really got, did a tremendous amount of work. They're related, but not close. This is me too, Gloria Offenbach. Um, Gloria was an original member of the South Central. She's from York and uh, her, her mother is Pennsylvania German background and her father was from Welsh people in, in Delta, but also uh, the grand, her, her grandmother in Delta said one grandfather was a Southerner and one was a Hessian. So uh, she, and she has a little bit of New England ancestry. Gloria got very involved in genealogy and her initial thing was the, um, the Schweitzer family of Springfield Township. And I think she's still working on that. Um, somehow that's how genealogy is. Um, but she's done a tremendous amount of work and she's done a tremendous amount for the South Central Pennsylvania Genealogical Society. She did a number of special publications um, several of them called Gone to Ohio, where she went through Ohio County histories. And of course, there's a large presence of Pennsylvania people that went to Ohio or people from this area. Uh, but probably the work I think she's most proud of is the Poor Children's List, where she went through uh, the York County tax records and extracted all the information on children. It was before the law uh, that the, the government paid for public education parents were supposed to pay. There was a, uh, if parents were too poor, then the local officials would pay for it, but they were listed in lists, which list the parents, the children, their age. And um, for those of us who, most of us do have some ancestors that are on the poor side, it really helps. It's sort of from the 1820 to 30 some period, uh, a period that can be a little tricky with records and so forth uh, for people that didn't leave a, a big, many records so um she she really helped with that and she she's in her 90s now and she continues to to research i speak with her periodically she in her career she was a proofreader and she is ever still the proofreader i did an article um on uh, we shared an ancestor the godly kunkel family as she comes from the eldest daughter who married craft villa and um I advanced a copy of that to her to read, and she found several typos that I made. So I was glad she did. And um, poor Eric, I was about here. She found another one. And luckily, we got pretty much all corrected before it went to print. But uh, And she helped many things for the Historical Society. She did proofreading for. And that Chance for Township book, she did a lot of proofreading. She, she did all of that. And, you know, she showed me how she did it. And if we'd all do that, we'd underline every word, really read every word. And um, she's, she's done a lot of research over the years. Continues to be very interested. Betty Eichelberger Brown. Betty was such a kind person. She was a volunteer here for years and years. Um, I believe she was a volunteer when Jonathan was here. And what day was Landon off? The 
day of the week did he? Was it Wednesday? <laughs> the story I was told, they all came in on the day that Landon was off because you were more easy going than Landon. <laughs> Landon wouldn't let him look at the books on the shelf. He said, they're all in the parks. You don't need to look at the books. So, uh, but she, she would volunteer. I know Sam Saylor a lot of times was the same day that she was and different people. And she, I think she volunteered several days. When she yeah, for, for many years. And she was uh, served on our board. I think she was our corresponding secretary. I think she was our research committee person for a long time. And she had many correspondents within uh, from our membership from all over the country. And, and she was a tremendous genealogist, very thorough. She would really research things. And she helped me out a lot. Her mother's maiden name was Shu, and I have Shu ancestry. And I'm this high school kid, and she really helped me out with that. And it, pointed me in a lot of the right directions. Very soft-spoken person, not, not someone that was, uh, uh, she was not an extrovert, I wouldn't say, but very kind. And uh, I never heard her say an unkind word about anyone. Um, and, and she was gone much too soon. Um, her husband, her first husband had died of melanoma and she had three young children. And she ended up marrying someone from my church who was a distant relative, um, Glenn Brown. And they lived uh, down in Chancellor Township on the Brown family farm for years and years. And, um, and then he passed away rather suddenly when they were visiting her daughter in California. So um, he died much too young as well. But um, Betty was really a, a wonderful person. Okay, in 2007, we uh, honored Ruth Etta, Naomi, uh, nicknamed Bunny. Richard Jacobs, born in 1931. She was the daughter of Guy William Richard and Elsie Ellen Stover. Uh, her husband was William E. Jacobs. Uh, Bunny's interest in genealogy was sparked in the early 1970s when she enrolled in an advanced genealogy class under John Heisey. At the suggestion of him, Bunny and several of her classmates decided to organize a local genealogy society, the groom that we are, South Central. They began by meeting at Bunny's home. And when the organization was finalized, Bunny was elected to the first president of the society. And she served two terms, 1975, 76, 76, 77. Bunny and her husband, William, reorganized the records of nine Catholic church records of nine Catholic churches into five uh, volumes, uh, marriages, births, baptisms, confirmations, and deaths. And uh, she uh, made the sets, I, I guess uh, published them, because uh, a set was delivered to the DAR in Washington personally by Bunny. Uh, she was a member of DAR and a number of lineage, lineage societies and served uh, uh, several offices in the organization. Uh, she um, then gave uh, the other set uh, volumes of the books to the history uh, here at library here and other lineage societies. Uh, her uh, surnames that Bunny completed research on were Richard, Jacob, Stover, and Lees. Bunny and her husband moved to Arkansas in 1995. And in 2006, she um, presented the society with the World War I scrapbook of York soldiers' letters that were sent home and then printed in the newspapers. It was a relative, a cousin of hers that had put that scrapbook together and she had had it for years and years. Well, it, it was kind of a, a comical thing because when she presented it, it was so moldy that Lila had a Bit, and we, she kept it in the back storeroom and wouldn't let it come into the building. And it was, it was really, and didn't want to tell Bunny that she, we were doing that, you know. But anyway, we, we did finally get it to Printostat and had it all digitized so that we could then get rid of the book. <laughs> but uh, Bunny was quite proud of that book. And uh, she uh, uh, was, was a, a very colorful character. <laughs> She's the only per only person Richard ever hung up on. <laughs> That's all right to say. <laughs> okay, then we have you have Patricia, better known as Pat Gross. 
Um, Pat, to a lot of people, was probably the, the, the face of the Genealogy Society. She was the director of operations for years. So new members, um, she sent them all kinds of information. She coordinated a lot of things with the operations of the, the society, the membership lists, the um, sending out the publications, the mailings. Um, she did all of that from her home in West York for years and years. Uh, she went to Red Lion High School. She was, um, um, her family is mostly, I would say, from the Forest Township, Bunrock area. She's actually about three quarters of the people that won this award are related to these one way or the other. It was only a couple of years ago I found out she's related to through the Lau family. Uh, one of her Amsbacher ancestors was married to my fourth great grandfather's daughter. So third great grandmother's sister of that. And they had a, and there was a nice picture. I think maybe her daughter put it on of that lady and her husband, Miss Felix Amsbacher. Um, this, this is obviously her, her high school uh, yearbook picture. Pat always liked to be a little bit glamorous, I would say, if she always sort of gave that vibe. She was a beautician. She, yeah, had, she, a, beautician. she had a beauty parlor in her house for many, many years. Um, and she was very involved uh, with the running of, of the South Central for many years. She also helped um, Leonard Heilman, who we'll talk about in a little bit, she helped him with compiling many of the early publications. Uh, the two of them would go to the courthouse and re research things. He was a teacher slash librarian at Northeastern High School. And when he was off during the summer, they would spend time gathering information because most of the information at that time was at the courthouse. There was no county archive as such in those days. And, um, and she helped a lot with that. So um, she did a lot of work. Pastor Frederick S. Weiser, um, he, he was given the award. He had died earlier that year um, in 2009. Um, he was a Lutheran pastor, a uh, family that actually, I believe it was Chicago that they had lived in, but he had moved back here to this area um, because of his great interest in his Pennsylvania German ancestry. He wrote the large Weiser genealogy as a descendant of Conrad Weiser, who was very famous and his daughter married um, Muhlenberg and uh, all that sort of thing. And there's a number of wives in Pennsylvania and York County even that descend from uh, that, from Conrad Weiser. Um, but Pastor Weiser for many years was an editor for the Pennsylvania German Society, um, contributed extensively to uh, their publications, uh, to Regaboga, wrote many different things. He also translated or transcribed many church records. He uh, had a position over at the uh, Theological Seminary in their archive there where he, he did a lot of that sort of work and was you know, considered to be one of the foremost scholars of Pennsylvania German um, history and culture and that sort of thing. And he could be quite an entertaining speaker as well. We had it a number of times. I, I know I think he sort of ticked off my mother. He went on about cookies, if they weren't rolled out cookies, were not real cookies, the, the crop cookies were rubbish and something to that effect. And, you know, he could be, he could be very opinionated. And uh, <laughs> there's many stories about Pastor Weiser, which we don't need to quite get into in this context, but he certainly contributed extensively to, to the field of Pennsylvania German research. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of times it would be honored people after their deceased and that, you know, it's our hope maybe we should honor people while they're still amongst the quick rather than the dead. So. Okay, Alfreda, Alfreda Patton Davidson, born in 1943 and passed away in 2008. She's the daughter of Alfred Bassett Patton and Edna Wagner. Uh, her husband was Albert Davidson, Reverend Albert Davidson. Alfreda was active in local and statewide genealogical uh, groups and organizations, both personally and professionally. She was one of the founding members of South Central and was a Charter Life member, and she wrote the original bylaws. She served on the board of directors in several offices. She was the original director of publications, and she wrote the first newsletters. 
She served several terms as president and many years as a director at large. She compiled special publication number 39, which was uh, post number 37 of the Grand Army of the Republic. She was a member and officer in several lineage societies, including DAR, Daughters of the American Colonists, Daughters of the Union Veterans, and Society of Descendants of Colonial Clergy. She was a professional gene genealogist for over 30 years, and she also served as the historian of the Frankenfield family and wrote the, the book about that, that family. She taught at Votech, New York Votech, until her retirement in 1997. And uh, she uh, willed her extensive library uh, of the genealogical materials to the York History Center and other historical and genealogical organizations. And there's Barb. There we have Barb. <laughs> I told you I had to cut off some of your hair. <laughs> it went up higher than that. But Barbara she, she assures Ann. me it was all her hair. I believe that. So Barbara Wolf Rudy has been a long time. It. Oh, you have it. Okay. It's not, and you can talk about it. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I mine's all written down. You, you go out. You're going to ask your mom. That's all right. Barbara Ann Wolf Rudy, born in 1940. Daughter of Preston Ellsworth Wolf and Louise Hendershot, and the wife of Charles Eugene Ruby. Barbara joined South Central in 1987 and started the search for the history of her family. She attended genealogy seminars and on vacation trips to several states, she made time to visit libraries and continued her research. Canada held the key to unlocking much of her Hendershot family history. In 1990, Barbara was appointed to the nominating committee of South Central, and it's a position she continues to hold in 2021. <laughs> she has been a valuable board member and goodwill ambassador for South Central and the History Center with the visitors and especially researchers from near and far to the library. Her knowledge of all the library holdings yeah, available for research is a great asset. She's always ready with a membership application to recruit new members for the society. And I think I can uh, truthfully say that she holds the record for the number of new members she's gotten for our society. Did you have anything you wanted to add? I was just going to say she has to be the foremost expert on the Hendershot family <laughs> in the world. So I was in Connecticut, a cemetery in Connecticut, and I looked, I'm looking for my family. And I look over and I see a Hendershot gravestone. And I, I couldn't wait to take a picture of it and, and then tell her about it. Because <laughs> I found a Hendershot. <laughs> okay, you are. <laughs> yes, yeah, 2001, June Burke Boyd received the award. And it's probably well overdue. Um, June is also from Chancellor Township as uh, Sam Saylor was, and um, she's actually probably one of the ones that's closest related to me. Her great grandfather's my great great grandfather, so whatever that makes us. Um, and we're related in a couple other ways, but we won't get into that. That gets too complicated. So, um, June uh, was a librarian at the Colt Rider Library in Red Lion, and then uh, became assistant librarian here at the Historical Society and then the librarian for many years and has done a tremendous amount of research and, and published works and she continues to do that right up to the present time. So uh, she became a real expert on all things York County. Um, her works on Towshine are, are probably foremost um, and just has been a wonderful ambassador for, for the uh, Historical Society of York County and then the Heritage Trust. And I guess you served as uh, uh, an interim period uh, before Jen Mummer, didn't you, as, as the director of everything, so. I was tired of the history time. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you always, when you come back, it's always, you, you do a great job. So um, I guess you're spending part of your time now in Florida and part, part here, right? So, um, but you continue to write on your county history and to research, and um, it's again it's been a lifelong interest of yours, and that's a, a real tribute. And and that was probably way overdue when, 
luckily we you know we're always happy to do people we have to think about these people we need to honor in their lifetime so that's that's almost 20 years that is 20 years ago so yeah but um definitely well deserved i guess this one's mine too okay mm -hmm. I had trouble finding a picture of Lynn. And this was from York Junior College, um, which she graduated from in 1958. He was from Mount Wolf and went to Northeastern High School, then York Junior College, then uh, Millersville University, and, uh, and Drexel, he had a, a library degree, and went and was a librarian, I believe, a Navy person at Northeastern High School until his retirement. He uh, was interested in genealogy and is did many of our early um, did many of our early publications. Um, he continued probably close to, close to 20 years doing the publications, but his health um, he was I think a lifelong smoker. I only ever remember seeing him once and he was on oxygen and so forth and he spent a lot of his time in Delaware um, after he retired. Um, but he, he did much with um, with the publications and uh, of that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. In 2013, we honored Donna Pottinger Shermeyer and her husband Gerald Shermeyer. Donna was uh, born in 1924 and died in 2017, daughter of William Pottinger and Sidney Zimmerman. And uh, Gerald was born in 1917 and died in 2010 son of Kerbin Henry Shermeyer and Elizabeth Seidelinger. Uh, Donna began volunteering at the Historical Society in the late 70s. Some of her early projects were organizing the extensive Zahn gene genealogical collection. Uh, she liked working with the school classes that came to research their families and local history. She spent uh, a lot of time researching the Strayer family back to its very early York County roots. And she worked with military author Franklin Gurley concerning the General Jacob Devers papers. She coordinated the research by mail service, doing much of the research herself. Besides her years of researching family histories, uh, she's done the genealogy on the Shermeyer, Dellinger, Dietz, Seip, Bakel, and Zimmerman families. After taking time off, she came back to volunteer at the York County uh, uh, Library Archives in 2011. Uh, her husband, Gerald, followed Donna's lead and became a volunteer also. Some of his projects included cleaning, organizing, and cataloging the motion picture films in the collection. He organized the 1,746 original Demp Wolf architectural drawings, housing them in archival folders and creating a comprehensive index. He retyped many of the family index cards that were deteriorating from age and kept the microfilm readers operational with his mechanical skills. Gerald did serve in the Army Air Force during World War II. Then we also honored Glenn Purcell, or Glenn, Glenn Purcell Zeck that year, um, born in 17 or 1921. I don't know why I'm thinking 17, but anyway, um, 1921 and uh, died in 20, 2011. He was the son of Harry Zeck and Katie Bollinger. Husband, or uh, his wife was Violet A. Barrick. Uh, Glenn was a farmer for his entire life. He loved research and was always interested in his family's origins. And like uh, a lot of us, wished that he had started asking questions sooner about his ancestors. He began researching in the uh, library in the late seventies. He joined South Central and became friends with fellow researchers, Sam Saylor, and Betty Brown. He began volunteering at the library, utilizing his knowledge of the German language. Every Wednesday morning, he and June Lloyd consulted over the thousands of surnames and their variations, deciding on the best method for organizing them. Some surnames have dozens of variations and his expertise in the pronunciation of them was key to organizing them. After he passed away in uh, 2011, 142 files housed in the 14 boxes of, his, of the, the years of his family research were donated to the library and the archives. The files in those boxes contain family information on 89 surnames. Um, ooh, I have the next part too. We don't know if we know this man. <laughs> what to say? 
Richard began his quest into gene genealogy as a teenager doing research with his grandmother, Olga Eva. Little known facts about Richard. He's the youngest person to receive the Henry J. Young Award. In York County, he doesn't meet many people that he isn't related to. Uh, I used to feel I was the only one that I was not related to him. He is South Central's own Wikipedia when it comes to the history and knowledge of English and European history. He has his own storage closet uh, full of LDS microfilms at the LDS Church in York. He plays cello with the, with the York Symphony Orchestra. He can translate German, French, and Latin. And oh, yes, he's an attorney at CJ Roberts. He's very familiar with area surnames and can usually set budding genealogists on the right track to their ancestors. Richard often presents meeting programs, sharing his knowledge about many subjects, also speaking at genealogy conferences and seminars. He embraces new happenings in the world of genealogy and promotes DNA testing at every opportunity and frequently does talks about the DNA. Um, he's been president of South Central 13 times since 1995, vice president 12 times, and he knew Henry James Young personally. That's our Richard. You're next. Catherine Jordan. Uh, we honored her in 2016, and she passed away the other year. She was nearly 100 years old. She was from Vaughan Township. Um, half of her ancestry was from the southeastern part of York County, and her mother was of Norwegian Finnish sort of background. So she was rather different. She was, I think, from Minnesota, her mother. Um, Catherine was a, a very interesting person. She was in intelligence during World War II. Um, she was a librarian at, at Kennerdale High School for many years um, and very involved in local genealogy, uh, especially in her home region and, um, and, and local history, right up to the end almost. Um, so she was a, a, a real, she was on our board. I think she was, um, was she recording secretary at one point? Yeah, recording secretary. There's a bit of a story to tell. Uh, she had some Quaker ancestry, so do I. And you went along. We went to Swarthmore, and who else was along? Oh, in fact, Becky was along, and they required us. I was a new attorney. They required us all to give them our driver's licenses to hold. I guess so we didn't steal anything. I don't know what we we're going to steal. So we were like driving through Lancaster County on the way home, and we all realized that we left our driver's licenses in Swarthmore. And I said, don't worry, I'm an attorney. You can give some excuse that you'll produce it within several days if you get pulled over. So uh, luckily, none of us were pulled over. And, uh, and they mailed them to us. The mail was a little more reliable in those days. But it was kind of a sort of a horrifying thing to realize that your, all our licenses were at Swarthmore Library, which was about an hour away, and they were closed. So, no one panicked. <laughs> and Catherine was she was very cool about everything. Mm -hmm. She was uh, she was pretty unflappable, I think. She she so that that's a good thing. She and Raptor both were co opted with both on the Southeastern School District, and then she also helped co opt with some of the Jordan South. Well, she did the for the class tax or whatever she did, Hopewell Township, I believe. But that was our first public yes. part of that was our first the publication first for the publication of class tax. Mm -hmm. So she kind of started that for us, which was a big help. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, now, who does that look like? <laughs> a famous actor, <laughs> Sherlock. Oh, yeah. Benedict, he looks like Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> so we're at 2016, and this is Franklin Grove Jr., born November 26th, several decades ago. He wouldn't tell when he was born. Uh, and, his birthday. Oh, do you? Okay. He's the son of Franklin Ross Grove Sr. and Ferry R. Miller, and his wife is Elizabeth Metzel. Thank you, Erica, for finding that for me. <laughs> and, and Barb, you were both helpers on that. Frank graduated from York Hospital School of Nursing in 1972, worked at York Hospital for many years. He has an associate degree from York College, a BPS degree from Elizabeth Town College, and obtained a paralegal certificate from Penn State in the early 2000s. Frank has been involved in many community and professional organizations over the years, 
and he's been a member of South Central since the 70s. He served as vice president from 2008 to 2010 and president from 2010 to 12. He also served as director at large for several years. He is in his 32nd year as a volunteer in the library at the History Center. Over the years, he's been very involved with several lineage societies and he has held several office, uh, offices in those societies and is a life member in most of them. In 2018, we honored Lila Foreman Shaw, and I'm uh, very happy that we did that. Um, Lila had an early interest in, in local history and genealogy and did a lot of research in the 1970s. And in about 1992, she started as assistant librarian here. And then, of course, when June retired, the first retirement, uh, mm -hmm. she became a librarian and archivist and served in that capacity uh, until she, her early uh, death. So um, tremendous uh, research and knowledge and work that she did over the years. I mean, she, uh, early on, uh, she did a lot of research in New York County cemeteries and, and, and great knowledge on that. Uh, she did the work on the mills that was published. Um, she also, um, Gazetteer. The Gazetteer, which has been a very published, a very popular uh, publication for the society and very, very useful. If you have some odd place name, you don't know what it is, you look in that Gazetteer and you're going to find out where it is. And that's thanks to Lila. She really did a tremendous amount of work. And, uh, and like I said, a lot of, a lot of knowledge, uh, really very knowledgeable about things. So um, sorely missed. And really glad that we did honor her with this. Okay, and the, the last uh, on our list, uh, again, 2018, we honored uh, Robert Schaub. And um, I pulled the history uh, from him when uh, we put it in the newsletter, and it was four, uh, five pages long. And I thought, how am I going to get this broken down into a very small amount? But um, there, it, most all of it is very interesting and uh, unbelievable the amount that he has achieved. Uh, but I got a little bit, got a little bit of it together. Anyway, he is a walking history book. At the very early age of ten, he began asking his mother questions about her Thompson family. Her answers started him on his quest. Even at the age of 88 in 2018, he was still working to learn more and share what he learned about history and the families in Shrewsbury Railroad Borough and that region of York County. In addition to his shop family, he has researched the Keeney, Kleinfelter, Thompson, Ray Meyer, Amy, and Wallace families. He has roots and branches that connect to many of the earliest York County families, Danner, Gladfelter, Live, Yount, Manifold, and uh, the Christopher Eby family in Lancaster. He's written several books, served on municipal boards, and was a tax collector. He's assisted many people writing family histories with the research and his personal knowledge. He's been able to show people the location of their ancestors' homesteads and sometimes the homes. He and his wife, Margaret, researched and gave talks on the World War II prisoner of war camp that was located in Stewartstown. He has belonged to several historical organizations, both in Pennsylvania and Maryland. He has large collections of York County memorabilia, photos, and postcards, and willingly shares his knowledge with all that asks. And I guess he is now 90 years old. And Thank you. So hopefully <laughs> that right. gives some inspiration for some nominations. Once we're uh, totally out of the pandemic situation, it'll be nice to have a, a presentation where we can give some awards. Thank you for coming. Can we make nominations anytime? Anytime. Yeah. Anytime. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe we can have someone have a, we should all have a camera. Maybe we've got a couple people that are here that are at the award. <laughs> well, let me see here. Yeah, I know. It's good. Yeah, does somebody have a camera? Oh, well, that phone. Too. Yeah, we all have phones. Yeah. Get uh, June and, and Barb. Oops. Yeah. Do it with Henry.
Is that all right? Yeah. I'll put that in the, in the newsletter. Come on, Barb. You can take your picture with Henry. And Jim. And Jim. Well, we're going to have to wait a couple minutes. No, we can include it on the video. No, because, no. <laughs> we can end the meeting too. This meeting adjourned. And we have refreshments. So there's, there's cookies. Yes, help yourself to some cookies. We, and some cookies. we always do do a little re, little refreshment thing with the Henry Young Awards. Oh, so. it used to be quite a feast. Yeah, we did. Do.